Hello everybody, this is Amir. So I'm presenting our paper, the session has been styled for efficient memory management. This is a collaboration with Andrew Fitzgibbon, Sandra Bevan Jones, and Timothy Switzerland. So let's first start with what, what is the goal of this paper. So we have certain machine learning and computer vision workloads with uh, the property that they consist of many small to medium sized arrays and actually we want to write them in a high level language and nevertheless we want to ha achieve uh, predictable performance under memory constraint environments. So uh, to do that, so first we define a high level language. So this, uh, this we, we call it F smooth. So this language <laughs> is a subset of F sharp and it's a higher order functional language. And actually, as we want to do machine learning and computer vision workloads, we need certain built-in constructs for array processing. So if I want to be more formal, this is the index <laughs> of our uh, formal language. So we have lambda calculus constructs, abstraction, application, variable, and also certain uh, constant values, and uh, that binding conditionals. And here is the Work. So uh, here you can see certain uh, built-in array, uh, array processing constructs. So I'm going to show you what is the uh, what is their semantic to run uh, through examples. So let's uh, introduce certain uh, vector functions. So this is map two function. So what it does is that for the given two input vectors, uh, it's going to apply the final function f over each of the elements, and it's, it's going to produce a vector with the same size as the two input vectors, and each element is actually the result of applying the binary function over the elements of the two input functions. So how we are going to do that? So of course we're going to assume that the length of the two input vectors are the same. So we're going to use this build construct, and actually the, build, the first element of the build is actually specifying the length of the output vector, and the second element of this build construct is actually for a given index, what should be the value of the element in that index, okay? So in this case, what we're doing is that actually we are saying that apply the binary function f over the i element of v1 and the i element of v2. And actually here this bracket notation is actually a syntactic sugar for the get construct that I showed you in the previous slide. So here I introduced three array constructs that I showed you in the previous slide. So this map to function is something very expressive, so now I can represent the uh, addition of two vectors using this map to by passing the addition binary function and also the element wise multiplication of two vectors by passing the multiplication operation. And also, so the fourth construct is the reduce so actually, intuitively, it's very similar to uh, a for loop in C. So a for loop without, weird, without using it in a weird way. So it starts from zero. Uh, it continues until, yeah, it's left B minus one. And for the i-th iteration, it, it computes the next state. So actually, in, a, in order to be in a purely functional language still, so what we do is that we do it in the fold way. So we, we accumulate the state at each iteration. And so now I can uh, define using the element wise uh, operation of two vectors uh, 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 together with some the dot product of two vectors. And also I can use this dot product of two vectors. If I, if I dot product the vector with itself and sum the elements, it's going to be really the, uh, and then I get the square root of that, it's going to be in the norm of the vector, the vector norm. I hope I'm not too fast. So, so let's see an example program, a toy program that we can write with that. So for the given two input vectors, first we're going to add them, and then we're going to compute the norm of that. So let's see what's the problem with that. So this program is going to construct two intermediate vectors which are actually not given. So let's inline it to 
to see why we are predicting two intermediate vectors. So if we line the implementation based on the video that I showed you before, so we can see that there's, there's these two build constructs here. Okay, so the problem that I want to solve here is our, it's quite well known in functional program community. So we have to do deforestation, fusion, so different names for that. So let's fuse it to see what's going to happen. So in order to do fusion, so as you might have noticed, so actually the, the build construct that I had was actually nothing but a pool array. So actually let's do the fusion for pool arrays. So whenever I see the getting E2 element of the build construct, so I'm gonna, it's nothing but applying the, the E1 function over the E2 index. And actually whenever I want a length of a vector besides E0, it's actually E0. So, as a result, I'm going to have this nice function without any intermediate vector. So, there is no vector annotation here. So, it seems very good. However, can I always do fusion? Or can I always do, or is fusion always desirable? So, the answer is obviously no. So, actually, up to now, I said what our paper is not about. So, Assume that you have some workload that you have usage of some external function. So for example, for some part of your program, you have a very hand-tuned implementation for a particular hardware, you want to really use that one. Okay? So for example, there is a blast routine that maybe you cannot beat it for matrix quantity quantification. Okay? Or there are some cases that you have multiple consumers. Okay? So in, in, in such cases, maybe you cannot do fusion easily. Or there are some cases that the, your consumers want to have some sort of random access on, on, on the vectors, on the arrays. And in these cases, fusion may hurt the performance. Okay? So, actually for showing you really what's going to happen in real cases, so I'm going to show you a computer vision use case that was actually our uh, main use case that, driven, that had driven uh, this whole effort. So, so bundle adjustment is a technique that, so you assume that you have several cameras. Yeah. So you have XK, XL, XM, so these are the position of the camera. And you have a 3D point, which is noted as LJ over there. And so you have, for each of these cameras, you have some sort of measurement of the projection of this point based on the rotation and based on some other parameters for the camera. And so what we would like to do, we want to compute reprojection error of that point for each of these cameras. Okay? So this is a snippet of code in FSmooth for, for a part of that problem. And so here you can see that we are using certain a vector operation, so this one is kind of computing square of the norm, and this one is like element by, uh, so multiplication by scalar, cross product of two vectors, dot product, and addition of two vectors. And uh, so let's see now what happens if we take this F smooth code and we generate C code for it. Okay, we do all the closure conversion and all, the, all those kind of techniques that are unknown. Let's see what happens. So here, yeah, the color is very bad. Here. So I'm going to show you where the bar stands. So this is the performance of f -sharp. So as I said, F-smooth is a subset of f -sharp, so I can use the f -sharp runtime in order to run it. So this is the peak memory consumption for, for bundle adjustment. So you see that in f -sharp, the peak memory consumption is like 10 megabytes. However, if I generate C code without doing proper memory management, I'm going to be around like around 10 gigabytes of memory cons peak memory consumption. Because I'm not doing any deallocation for the memory that I'm allocating. And so you might say that, OK, fuse it, and then you're going to remove everything, every memory, every kind of intermediate vector allocation. But as I said, there are some cases that we cannot remove of them, even without fusion. So yeah, we get the one order of magnitude less memory consumption, but still, if you see the, uh, the F-sharp memory consumption, and also 
idiomatic C++ code written by hand, you see that it's not pure. So it's like one megawatt. So, and here you can see the <coughs> runtime. So you see that the, the generated C code in the, the runtime is comparable to F sharp. And actually, whenever we fuse it, we, we get maybe the times better performance. However, the C++ code is much, much faster. Okay, so we want to solve both, both two problems. So the first solution that comes into, my, into our mind is that, okay, let's use a garbage collector. Okay, so in C, there is void garbage collector. Let's use that. Let's see what happens. Great, now we have reduced our memory consumption even less than a sharp. Okay, so this is where the graph stands. However, the runtime is getting even worse. So, to summarize, so we have used garbage collection, but it has runtime overhead, and its performance is not predictable. So it's not quite that much appropriate for embedded systems which has which have uh, uh, memory constraints. So we have introduced the technique, this national classic style, that actually we, to every function, we are passing the destination memory. And so this is not a new technique. It has been existed in CVC, C++, Fortran. So whenever they wanted to return arrays, we can see that they do not really return it. You pass it as a parameter, and the, the functions are going to fill in that. Or in functional languages, there is this notion of recursive functional concept, which has very similarities with, with, with this session passing stuff. And uh, so, in order to get you a rough idea of what it does, is that so this is the normal implementation of add, norm, and the f function that I've shown you. So this is the destination passing style notion of them. So to the add, you see that there is this red thing that I'm adding. This it doesn't show you the colors very well. So uh, and here you can see that I have an alloc construct that has allocated a certain amount of memory. And then I'm using in this DPS version of add the, that, that uh, allocated region. So somehow the question here would be that, OK, how should I compute this size? So should I allocate too much memory? Or what should I do? So actually, this problem is cardinality inference. And this is not such an easy problem. So in the worst case, the uh, expression which represents the cardinality of a given vector expression could be as complicated as the original expression. And where in general, two approaches. So one approach is that, yeah, let's replicate the original computation and I put the size at the end. Okay? Yeah, for that expression, I'm going to allocate it on if, and then I'm going to free the whole thing at the end in order to solve the memory management problem. Yeah, but somehow you have to rely on too many optimizations later on so that it tries to simplify the, the size expression, especially if you're writing in a functional language, you have to rely on all these kind of pathological optimizations and this kind of thing. And so it works fine in many cases. Uh, however, there are some cases like creating Fibonacci size arrays that it can make it an or so, so complex it was, it can make it much, much more work, much, much worse. So there are some other approaches which are using type systems, program analysis, program transformation. So yesterday there was a talk about size types. And also the, in, in, in the Fulhard program language, they have the, the notion of size slicing, that actually the program slicing in order to infer the size. So actually, our technique is very similar to uh, it, it falling into the second category, I would say. So we call it shape inference. So what we're going to do is that of course, we're going to restrict the language even further so that we have managed recursion. So as you've seen, so we have already only two notions of recursion. We don't allow arbitrary recursion in our language. So, but still, the, the language is expressive enough for a large class of machine learning and computer vision workloads. And uh, so the other restriction is that each shape should be only dependent on other shapes. So you cannot have a shape which is dependent on an element of a particular matrix. And so this gives us a very good guarantee for a particular F-smooth program. We can compute the shapes 
in a constant space and constant computation time. And so if it doesn't fall, if, if it falls into, uh, uh, doesn't fall into that subset of F sharp that, uh, that we support as F smooth, so we fall back to the first approach that I said, which is a <laughs> So let's see now what's going to happen with the program that I've shown you. So this is somehow simplification of that. I, I'm not showing you the full program. You can refer to the paper to see the full program. So we have, in addition to this uh, uh, normal computation, we have added some sort of shape computation. And if you see, it gets two cardinalities and it turns another cardinality. And somehow, in order to compute how much memory we need, so we are going to use the, uh, the return cardinality from at shape. So, and let's see what's the generated C code. So, for the, so this is the previous figure that I've shown you, the left side. So the right hand side is the generated C code. So you can see that here we have memory allocation. And then, in the, so the, after this lexical scope, we're going to inject a free. And uh, yeah, this is the corresponding part for a lot. So let's see what's going to happen with memory consumption. We have reached to a position that now a little bit even better than the C++ code. Okay, of course we are better than the garbage collector and the or anything else. However, still our runtime is getting even now worse than the garbage collector version. And this is because, yeah, it's a constant factor, but still we have to compute also the shapes to see how much memory we should allocate. So, and also, of course, if you compare it to the, uh, to the leaky version, so in the leaky version we don't have free, so free is also time consuming. So there are certain optimizations that now we can do. Of course, I didn't apply fusion. The first optimization to do is that I apply fusion. Apart from that, now I can partially validate these shape expressions. Okay, I can align them, I can do constant folding for them. And also now I can I have explicit memory allocations. I can hoist them out of the loops. Okay, out of the reduced, let's say whenever I have a reduced, I can hoist the allocated memory so that I don't have malloc and free inside the loop. And also I have I can merge two memory allocations, two consecutive memory allocations together. Okay? In addition, in the runtime, I can, so as the whole thing ensures that I have a stack allocation discipline, I can use bump and buffer allocation. So I can free allocate a huge bulk of memory. And now, my memory and free is going to be under only a pointer array, a simple pointer array. Let's see what's going to happen. So the memory consumption is going to remain the same. So when, as, as soon as you do DPS, it's going to be very good the peak memory consumption. However, the runtime. So after the doing fusion, so we reach to something that we will get in fusion for the leaky version too. However, now here I do certain buffer optimizations, which like merging in buffer allocations and this kind of stuff. And here I do bump allocation buffers. And you see now we are better than the idiomatic C++ code that we have written, as well as and an implementation using Eigen, Eigen library, which is going to using template programming in, in C++ in order to do fusion and all these kind of things. This is the runtime of what operation? This is the runtime of uh, the bundle adjustment problem. So the, the computing the reprojection error for, let's say, 10,000 points. So to summarize, I've introduced uh, the F smooth. Uh, functional language, which is actually higher, higher the functional language for array processing. And we have introduced a uh, distinction passing style technique for, gen for automatically generating custom memory management. So somehow I, I skipped the details. So to see the details you, and the formalization, you can refer to the paper. And also in the paper, you can see that we have experimented with uh, certain other machine learning and computer vision models, such as Gaussian mixture model. Uh, Gaussian mixture model and uh, hand tracking, and also we state some uh, even more guarantees that we ensure based on this language. And actually, we have seen that we are generating C code which is comparable 
to uh, certain tuned C and C++ libraries. And so I had some future work, but I think I should skip it now. So thank you for attention. The code is also available on GitHub. You can port it. You can see the address. Can you go to your C code that you showed? It was just before the slides. Um, I had a question. I think maybe I missed something. Um, you have Aleph, and then you, yeah, this is good up there. So you Aleph, you get the result, and then you free the storage, but then you return the result. Is that no. only because the results? Uh, that's another? a very good one. Yeah. So, so this result is actually an array result. So if you see, this result has no dependency on, yeah. on, the, on this memory. So what happens when you do want to return the storage? Is that storage, that would have been storage that had been allocated <coughs> a level up? That, that's a very good point. So it depends whether your the storage that you want to return is the result of the table function or not. If, it, if it's a result of the table function, you're going to reuse the storage that you have passed for the, for the outer function. However, it's not, if it's not a storage function, it's going to be somehow copied into the new thing. So this is reminiscent in terms of the scoping and various aspects to region-based memory management. Yes. The inference. And there's been various versions that uh, um, are doing things like uh, not size-based, but, uh, but basically allocating dynamically in a region. Mm -hmm. and, and actually also tracing uh, region lifetimes uh, throughout mm -hmm. uh, these calls. And they seem to have good... I was just wondering how far would you actually get with a region-based so implementation uh, that does not do all that refined <coughs> analysis of the sizes. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, one one thing is that so the work that I've seen for region-based memory management. So they are not trying to restrict the language that much. Okay. So so they are trying to be on ML, and I think the main case that they have to deal with is this polymorphic recursive functions and those kind of things. And I I think from there from the papers that I've read. So they're also stating that actually the main, uh, so one of the key issues for them is these global regions and infinite regions. And because of them, they have to somehow combine region-based memory management with garbage collection in order to get a good, decent performance for, for generating workloads, let's say. Well, yeah, but just, yeah, actually, yeah, the, the most recent, like, that's the ML with regions work. Yeah. They have a, a global memory that's garbage collected. Mm -hmm. But most of the other regions are actually then analyzed. You know, yeah. there's most of them are finite, so they get actually compiled away. Yes. And for the other ones, they're dynamic. There are certain ways of managing the runtime, so it's not yes. just you know a single array, but there's certain mm -hmm. efficient ways of doing it. The question is actually how far you would get to this rather more. Uh, but but the lifetimes then in some other systems are tracked. Yes. So you can you can make sure that they get deallocated as early as possible. Yes. Yes. Somehow then they. That you want to enforce this stack discipline. Right, yes. Yeah. So somehow if you don't enforce stack discipline, the disadvantage that then you cannot use this bump allocation in, in, in your runtime, if I'm correct. So at the time, if you don't predict the size of the region, like in advance, right? So there is a region and we know where to retreat, but we don't know how big it will be. Here we know exactly how big it will be, yes. just doesn't allocate that space contiguously and it's all in a stack like way. So it's it's sort of it's a it's a step less expressive but Operationally much faster. Oh, yeah, you know it is going to be operationally much faster. Mm -hmm. that, that was actually my question. I, th I think one, one thing that maybe we can do in the region base, I'm not sure whether they can do or not, so is that so this hoisting out memory allocation. So as we know the size, and if we see that the size is not dependent on the loop, we can host it outside. And in many cases that actually we have seen, so the size is going to be kind of preserved across different loops. I think that in region-based memory allocation, so with this dynamic approach, they're going to allocate it inside the function itself. We're going to allocate it outside. So we have this opportunity of hosting the memory allocation outside and do the memory allocation only once. Whereas I think in memory, in region-based, maybe you have to somehow allocate it inside the function. And some, I'm not sure how much this, this is going to work in general case that actually you can reuse that region for, let's say, another invocation of the same function. You have to there are techniques for that, where you sort of allocate dynamically in a region, but then you can reset it and reuse the memory. So, okay. okay. And, and also, there is a lot of work on, on finite region as, as... Yes, 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 as absolutely. 
where we where we also know exactly the the size of the of the region and can allocate okay. the understand yeah, good, that uh, ML kit does that I think uh, talked to Martin Martin Osman, mm -hmm. and they did some statistics on it and it was sort of the, the large the sort of I think it was in the sort of top 80s or something that that were known known sizes actually but I think that works only for let's say product types or, and these kind of things I'm not sure whether how much it's going to be feasible for like collections or vectors and these kind of things. Yes. The, the uh, last question. Yes. So uh, you were using the Ethereum garbage collector as, uh, as your garbage collector. Yeah. Since your language doesn't seem to support pointer types uh, or pointers, uh, why not just use reference counting, old fashioned reference counting? Uh, yeah, we can. So that was the, the kind of standard garbage collector that we found. Yeah, of course, that, that's also a possibility.